Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. I've been told this is a worldwide distribution. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Weisbrod for inviting me to speak with you folks. This is an honor. Uh, the topic I was asked to speak about was basically pandemics as a new way of life. Um, I'm Dr. Marjorie Pollack, Deputy Editor of ProMed Mail, and I will hopefully figure this out. Um, when we think about pandemics, we think about new events that have happened over the past 50 years or more. And this is a graphic uh, map presentation showing folks all the new outbreaks, not all of them, but major import outbreaks with new uh, pathogens that were discovered in the past 50 plus years. Uh, we can see we had, and forgive the typo here, it was an H1N1 influenza in 2009. Uh, we had the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, which was a massive outbreak, lasted two years. We had the SARS outbreak in 2002, severe acute respiratory syndrome. And we had the MERS coronavirus outbreak in 2012 that is still ongoing. Uh, these are just to name a few of uh, new outbreaks. So what is a pandemic? Uh, if you look it up in the Dictionary of Epidemiology, the definition is an epidemic occurring worldwide or over a very wide area, crossing international boundaries and usually affecting a large number of people. So. We had the SARS epidemic. It hit 27, 26, excuse me, countries were affected. This was back in 2002 through 2003. And there were a little bit over 8,000 cases associated with this outbreak. Um, fortunately, it was not sustained. And after 8,000 cases, as you can see, the epidemic curve uh, clearly shows it was brought under control. And it basically, the major part of the outbreak lasted from January of 2003 through the end of June, or actually July of 2003. Returning to the question, a quote which I think summarizes what a pandemic really is, and that's a new or novel agent that emerges with worldwide transmission. This was a quote from Mike Osterholm in a New York Times article uh, back in 2009, and it related to the H1N1 pandemic, H1N1 influenza pandemic. Uh, here's a map showing estimated mortalities. Uh, it was a worldwide event that was uh, precipitated by a new strain, a new between quotes, strain of influenza virus. In fact, H1N1 was the strain of the 1918 pandemic. And it went worldwide very quickly, began in Mexico and spread from there. Now I'm gonna backtrack a bit and I'm gonna talk about the One Health concept. And the One Health concept has come up in recent years uh, discussion, although it's been known about for a long time, even before the name was coined. And it basically says that we all live in this together, that there, is, there are links between human health, animal health, environmental health, and we can't just keep an eye on one. Uh, folks here are focused on human health and the impact 
you know, folks in the audience and the impact on transmission amongst humans. But this didn't happen if it wasn't for disease transmission in animals and then environmental conditions leading up to the facilitating the transmission. So going, why do I bring this up? And it's because how do these novel diseases begin? This is the question. I've got two figures here. One is 75%. And that is over the last 25 to 50 years, 75% of newly emerging diseases in humans were zoonotic. What zoonotic means is a species jump from the animal kingdom over to the human kingdom. So you have SAR, um, excuse me, you have HIV. Uh, HIV, we, we first became aware of it in 1981. Well, it turns out it was a jump from a simian, which is the um, ape world. A simian HIV virus jumped over to humans in rural Africa. There was low level transmission until urbanization started happening and people started leaving their rural communities infected with the virus and the behavioral changes that happened when they moved out of the area where there was a large use of commercial sex workers. And the whole situation just was a perfect incubating pot for spreading of new diseases. So 75% of the new diseases were a species jump from animals over to humans. The 70% number is that 70% of the new diseases in animals have their origin in wildlife. And the wildlife diseases make a jump over to the domestic animals, which would include livestock in many parts of the world. And from there, they can jump to humans because of the close proximity. A very good example of that was the MERS coronavirus, where MERS is the Mideast Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus uh, that cropped up in the Middle East. And the domestic animal that is the intermediary host is the camel. And camels are like our livestock in the Middle East. And there's a very close proximity between the human population and the animal population. So how they jump from species to species as mentioned, this close contact with domestic animals, including livestock. And we've had humans encroaching upon wildlife habitats. We've had the expansion of living areas into formerly wildlife uh, grazing areas. But we've also had wildlife being captured, being cultivated, and being served as food in locations. And here's a wet market where bats are on the menu to purchase for food. Um, this has all been going on over the last century, more so in the last 50 years. Now let's jump over to COVID and the first alert. I can't give a talk represented ProMed, representing ProMed without tooting our horn. And here is an excerpt of a report that we put out on 30 December 2019. And it was the first alert to the world outside of China that something was going on. And we basically had on the evening of December 30th, there was an urgent notice on the treatment of the pneumonia of unknown cause that was issued and widely distributed on the internet by the medical administration of the Wuhan Municipal Health Committee. 
I wrote a, I had received an alert from colleagues in Taiwan asking if we knew anything about this outbreak. And it was based on a lot of social media reports. What I wrote as an explanatory note, which we have, we write moderator notes on ProMed. Having been involved in moderating the SARS coronavirus outbreak and the MERS coronavirus outbreak, this type of social media activity that is now surrounding this current event in Wuhan was very reminiscent of the original rumors. Um, I really had a gut feeling we were in for trouble and we might be doing revisiting SARS or a relative of SARS. Stepping back a moment just to mention ProMed. ProMed is the program for monitoring emerging diseases, a program activity of the International Society for Infectious Diseases. And we basically serve as an early warning system for emerging and re-emerging diseases around the world. We put out these reports on a daily basis. We have an average of about nine reports. We are free of charge. Uh, we serve as an alert for the world on events of potential interest uh, and keep our finger on the pulse of what may be happening in terms of emerging diseases. Here's a map of effective uh, October 1, when there had been 33.8 million confirmed cases of COVID reported to WHO. There have now been over 35 million just in the past four days, including over 1 million deaths reported. Uh, you can see there is a heavy involvement. You can see the countries with very heavy involvement. Um, this is uh, WHO's update. They do a weekly update, plus they have a daily update on country by country. Transmission routes, I'll breeze through quickly because there is another talk on that will be involving transmission routes. Respiratory droplets are the primary route when people are speaking, sneezing, coughing, singing that's when they are released into the environment. They can land on hands, object surfaces, and then you can be infected by touching your hands to your face or mucous membranes, rubbing your eyes, rubbing your nose. Um, a key difference between the, the COVID-associated SARS coronavirus number two and the original SARS coronavirus is that with this, with the coronavirus causing COVID-19, infected people without symptoms can transmit the virus. Peak viral loads are pre-symptomatic or occur in asymptomatic individuals who we feel can transmit the virus. Also, aerosolization of the virus can occur, especially in crowded locations and inadequately ventilated locations. Of importance is 20% of people are responsible for 80% of cases. We refer to these events as super spreading events when one infected person can transmit to many others at a gathering. We talk about the three C's, crowded locations, close contact, lack of uh, observance of social distancing, and a confined space with poor ventilation. And that's of concern, I would imagine, for ferry operators, the close contact and potential crowding on ferries, so that environmentally it is a potential super spreading event location that needs to be dealt with and prevented. An important takeaway message for all of this is that we live in a global village. Uh, this slide is 
trying to communicate. We've got animals, we've got insect vectors, we have humans, we have transport, we have trucks, we have boats, we have ferries, we have airplanes. It now takes less than 24 hours to get from one part of the world all the way around to the other part of the world. So that pathogens do not need visas to, to change countries. Humans may, but pathogens no, don't, nor do vectors such as mosquitoes or ticks nor do livestock theoretically do, but they, when you're near borders, they manage to cross to do their grazing. Um, and this is important. Um, I should have enlarged in this particular image of a ferry because this is a means of transportation for potentially taking cases from one location to another. The bottom line is events are going to continue to happen. You can see how much they've been happening over the past 50 years. In the space of less than 20 years, we've had three very significant new coronaviruses crop up. The original SARS coronavirus, the MERS coronavirus, and now the SARS coronavirus number two responsible for the COVID pandemic. We need to keep our fingers on the pulse. We need to keep alert to what's going on. And we need to think about the fact that whatever changes we may be making today for COVID-19, we should consider keeping them in place moving forward because these pandemics are going to continue. Life as we know it must adapt. We need to be prepared for future airborne droplet and aerosol infections. And thank you. Thank you very much for listening. And